Welcome to Master of Science with host Professor James McCanny. Okay, we're going to give you a little update here on Comet uh, 3i Atlas and then also some other interesting celestial objects in the solar system today. Um, a couple days ago, I was actually on a radio show Thursday night with uh, Jeff Renz, and he brought up the fact that there was an asteroid, uh, what is it, Q2, I believe it is, uh, TQ2, and it came within 260 miles of Earth. It's considered a zero uh, lunar distance asteroid. It was only about 10 feet across, so this is not something that's about the size of maybe a closet, a big, uh, maybe a walk-in closet. And uh, it was coming in at around uh, 35, uh, through about 33,000 miles per hour, which is about twice orbital velocity. So it probably would have burned up before it ever hit. And apparently it came by the polar cap, or Antarctica, I'm sorry, the southern polar cap. Uh, and so that's one issue. And then there's another one, I think it's called TP, 2025 TP, the same velocity and 0.3 lunar distances, so relatively close. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff flying around out there. Here's a complete list of a one-day uh, list. And uh, so, yeah, the everyday stuff is flying by Earth. We're a small target, but, you know, eventually we might get hit. But I want to tell you something it's being very much overstressed. Like if, if one of these babies hit your house, yeah, it would be a bad day for you. But the impact uh, results of asteroids hitting Earth have been greatly overstated. And I heard some clown, uh, that's the only reason, the only good name I can give some of these people, claiming that there are very big asteroids in the comet debris belts where the uh, where we see the, uh, uh, the the meteor streams that sometimes Earth will pass through. And that's not true. It is not true at all. It's a supposition that simply does not have any weight. The reason being is because uh, the uh, comets are not dirty snowballs. Let's just make that clear. They're the discharge of the solar capacitor. And what they do, the way they build the meteor streams, is through the induced electric dipole force, which is a force that acts on objects with metal in them. And so this only works for very small objects. That's why when we see a meteor stream, we don't see big objects. We see these little pea-sized things, something that makes a streak across the sky um, that looks, uh, lights up, is very beautiful. It's probably the size of a pea or smaller. Um, or some could be as uh, small as a dust grain, and uh, probably nothing bigger than a uh, tennis ball, for example. A tennis ball would be big on the scale of things that could be drawn in into a meteor stream that accompanies a comet, even large comets, because what's, what's happening is they're moving very quickly, and the, the big objects don't have enough time even if they were, say, solid metal, the induced electric dipole force would not, uh, it would not draw them into the orbit of the comet. So meteor streams are, are by their very design, small objects. Uh, and like I say, probably the size of a baseball or smaller. A baseball or a tennis ball would be a large one. So I just want to make that clear. So the object that went by the the, T, uh, the Q2 object was 260 miles away, but it, if it would have hit uh, the atmosphere, it probably would have never made it to the ground. And if it did, it might have come down in a few pieces or something like that. So it was a very small object. But that's not saying that if something, let's say, um, let's look at a, uh, I've been at the Winslow, Arizona site, there's a crater, it's about a mile across. You can see it in the open desert. And uh, they have a chunk of the asteroid that hit, or the meteor, it's more of a large meteor, meteorite, that hit the Earth to cause that crater. And that's what's left. Now, most of it probably disintegrated 
and that that metal piece that's in the museum there would be uh, uh, smelted or melted uh, on the spot, and then you know how metal uh, coagulates in a sense uh, when you're melting it, and uh, so that object probably uh, that hit probably had a diffuse amount of metal in that because of the heat there at the center, at the impact center, um, that metal uh, congealed. But we really don't know the size of the object that created that crater. But it was a very local event, a very local event. Uh, the the uh, supposed crater in Yucatan that created the supposedly, allegedly, it was claimed for many years, caused the demise of the dinosaurs, really never did. People finally went back there, real scientists. And there was it was one of those flash-in-the-pan things where, oh, that sounded good. They needed an excuse for the demise of the di dinosaurs. And so that excuse held for a long time because it was led by a guy who was a, already a Nobel Prize winner. But uh, the reality is, is then people finally went back to the crater, the the crater rim of that uh, that uh, crater that in Yucatan it spreads up into the Gulf of Mexico from Yucatan Peninsula. The actual epicenter is out in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, what they realized is that the dinosaurs didn't even go extinct in the crater basin or around the rim area. They, the dinosaurs lived on after that event. And so it did not cause a, even a local demise of the dinosaurs, let alone worldwide. The reality is when an asteroid hits, most of the energy is directed back up, kind of like a, a cannon. If you remember the old, the very first cannons that were used in warfare were short. They were a short barrel because they couldn't lug up these, these great big uh, long iron cannons. Eventually, they could, and they were more made more streamlined. But the very early cannons were kind of like a, a very short, and they shot uh, maybe rock or or iron uh, shot in them, uh, but they were very short. But even as short as they were, the the blast was directed outwards. The blast was directed outwards, and that's what happens when an asteroid or a meteor hits the Earth. Is it it burrows in the earth is very is almost liquid when this it's almost a liquid fluid flow and most of that energy comes straight back up and out of the atmosphere and, and goes away but or it might come back and and layer back down on earth but it's uh the damage has been far overestimated from asteroid or meteorite hits on planet earth uh, and we've seen them hit the moon. I mean, we, we've actually seen craters form on the moon from things hitting it. And they're, they're just local events. Most of that energy is absorbed. Okay, on to 3i Atlas. Here we are, Tuesday, or Thursday. Uh, the, no, actually, between Thursday and Friday, if you're in the United States, the Comet 3i Atlas passed Mars. And NASA shut down... European Space Agency shut down, and people are going, oh, well, the government is shut down. Well, no, you have to understand, the people are still going to work, but they're just not getting paid. So the idea that NASA is not releasing data because of that, and besides, most of the satellites that we're observing 3i Atlas are from the European Space Agency, not from the United States, not from NASA. So the um, uh, European Space Agency has access to all of the NASA data. So why in the world, in the universe, are they not releasing any data? Uh, now, I've seen some, some wannabes, I call them that, on the Internet trying to piece together data and making claims, but it's really, uh, no, it's, it's, it's a hack job, and I refuse to go down those roads trying to piece something together that is not meant to be, that is not data. So NASA has refused to release data. And I can tell you why, because everything I predicted regarding comets, what would happen at Mars with this comet was, I'm sure that it all happened, electrical discharges, everything that NASA would deny has been observed 
and they're hiding the data. Once again, just criminal behavior on the part of their, our illustrious space agency, NASA, never a straight answer. And so we're now in day, what is this? Uh, I'm doing this on Sunday afternoon. This would be at around uh, 7 o'clock Eastern time on Sunday, the 5th of uh, the 5th of October. NASA hiding data. Crucial. And what are they doing? They're protecting their holy grail. They're protecting their image. They're, they're denying my work, which is central, which has been around since they've been doing this for 50 years, folks. And uh, this is just another example of NASA hiding data to protect their holy grail. Because really, they're not experts. They might have PhDs, but they're a bunch of flaming idiots. That's the best thing I can say about them. Uh, and they're, they're hiding this. They're, they're, if you look online, it's Dirty Snowball Comet Model. No, it was a long time ago, decades ago. Uh, in fact, when I was at Cornell, but I had a, a verbal and confrontation with them on campus where I sent around a sheet of paper that uh, basically accused NASA of hiding data, doctoring data, and uh, and uh, to protect their pet theories. And I went around and I talked to the faculty on the entire campus, uh, on campus. So it was not something that was uh, that people really appreciated. Let me put it that way. Anyway. Uh, I'm going to end this right now, but NASA, once again, hiding data. Uh, so that was last Thursday into Friday. Pick your day when the comet uh, passed Mars, 3I Atlas, and not a shred of data coming out of NASA. Criminal. Okay, this is the public uh, YouTube presentation of this information. I'm going to have extended information on my Patreon channel on this topic and more other daily postings there. I encourage you to go there and I'll have uh, quite a bit more information on this topic. And that is patreon.com slash jmccsci. So go to the Patreon channel for more information on this topic.